And do you own your home? We own the home with the bank. Um, so we do. <laughs> that is a great way. That is a great way to put it. Um, that's how I view a lot of things. Like I co-own my my degrees, and I, we we own our we make a mortgage payment um, every month. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lindsay Stanberry. I am the founder of The Purse, which is a site for women and money. And I worked for many years as a journalist at Fortune and CNBC and Refinery29. And I'm Barbara Ginty, and I'm a certified financial planner. I'm the host of the Future Rich podcast, and I own a wealth management firm during the day. And Lindsay and I are very excited to be bringing you a four-week series where we're interviewing real women about their money. It should be really interesting. Tune in and you can check out all of our interviews. So how did you hear them? Yeah, so um, I read Lindsay's book um, actually just a couple weeks ago um, and really enjoyed just transparency that was in it and also like being able to see how other people spend their money, how they talk about and relate to money, how it relates to what they do for their career, but also like their uh, their spouses and their partners and their you know future decisions and just um money is so nuanced and I think that we can get caught up in like my money is nuanced but everyone else has their sort of figured out right. and it was very right. much just a great way to kind of see how other people relate to it and explore it and talk about it and also I mean seeing just the differences in where people live and what they spend mm -hmm. and you know, it just, I think it's a great awareness and uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, and so from that, um, very quickly followed you, Lindsay, um, and I, I've been searching and I've, I found the change purse and then that brought me to you, Barbara, and I listened to a couple of your podcasts. So yeah, that's how we got here. <laughs> so nice. Yeah, that's great to hear. And tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. Yeah. So I um, am 30 years old. So I work in the education sector. I specifically work in higher education. Um, and I would like to share that the views and the opinions that I'm sharing represent myself and not my employer. But so I um, work in higher education. I have my bachelor's in um, education in foreign languages, and then I have my master's in higher education administration. And so um, my whole career has been in higher education. I've worked in student affairs. I currently work um, in advancement and um, fundraising, I guess is kind of the, the nomenclature, the, the, the known nomenclature for that. And so that's what I do career wise. Um, I'm married. I have a spouse. We've been married for six years, six years, <laughs> um, been together since 2010. So very much kind of our life. We don't have any children. We have a dog. I'm trying to think what else? That's kind of it. My life is my work and my family. So um, that kind of encompasses all the things. <laughs> and you're based down in Virginia, right? Yes. Yeah. So we're in Southeastern Virginia. And have you always been there? Are you close to family or did you move for school? Yeah. So we, um, so I'm originally from, um, New York, central New York. Um, and mm -hmm. I went to undergrad there and then I went to, um, grad school in Pennsylvania, um, just because it was an incredible opportunity to go to the program, to have my tuition paid for with a graduate assistantship. Um, and then after that, I returned home for a year. Um, and I started my career, my husband and I got married. Um, and then together we moved to South Carolina. Uh, we worked there for a couple of years and then we moved to Virginia after the pandemic, mid pandemic, I guess, probably to be a little bit closer to home. Um, obviously not at home, but, you know, a little bit closer than South Carolina is. So that's sort of been our trajectory. We wanted to move away when we got married and I got an incredible opportunity in South Carolina. Um, and then again, the pandemic brought us sort of back to closer and I have a great opportunity here now. That's great. And so were you able to graduate with a master's without taking on student loan debt? I took on a a $1,000 um, oh. just to have that buffer um, for my apartment in case something happened. Um, my grad school was very, very grateful for um, I had my tuition covered through a graduate assistantship and I also got a stipend through my graduate assistantship. And then I worked the summers before both semesters to help cover like my apartment costs mm -hmm. while in grad school. And then like anything I made through my stipend was like food and 
kind of normal, normal things, so to speak. But yeah, I took just a little bit just to have um, a small buffer. And that was on the recommendation of my dad just to be like, hey, you know, things might change a little bit. So let's, you know, have a little bit of room here in case something happens. Was it a student loan or a personal loan? I'm just curious. Yeah, it was a student loan. It was a, fe- a yeah. federal loan. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Do you have student loans from your undergrad or are you completely loan free? I do. Yeah. So I have, um, I have private loans, um, for my first two years of undergrad, and then I have federal loans for all four years. And so ironically, and this is, um, also not, not necessarily knowing about financial aid and how financial aid and institutional based scholarships work. Um, I got a, a, a full tuition scholarship as well for um, undergrad, but with, it was like minus whatever you get for financial aid. And we got a great financial aid package. So you take the financial aid because it's part of that. Um, so we took out just a little bit my first and second year to help cover um, like room and board and that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And then my third and fourth year of undergrad, I was a resident assistant. So that helped cover what I, what I would have taken out in a private loan. And then you qualify because you work in education for the public service loan forgiveness? I don't yet because um, I haven't okay. worked long enough. So I've only okay. been working. Um, oh, but, but are you in the program currently? Like, are you getting the qualification years? Um, I should be because I've worked at all of the institutions I've worked at are non for, non-for-profit. Non-for-profit. So, in theory, yes, but I'm very much hoping to get my loans paid off before the 10 year mark. Okay. Yes. So yeah. Yeah. I'm very hopeful. <laughs> That's great. So it doesn't seem like student loan debt paid played a huge part in your, in your finances. Um, it does just because I'm, we want to get it paid down and paid off and get it done mm-hmm. with. So like right now my private is, I have about 3000 left. And I'm like, can like we just got to get to the point where I can pay that off, and then we can move ahead. Um, and then my federal loan is at eleven thousand. Um, and so my one regret, thinking about my loans, is during the pandemic I was still paying on both, even though the interest stopped accruing for um, my federal loan. Um, and so I wished I had just transferred like once the private loans kicked back in and federal loans stayed interest-free until kind of mm-hmm. now. Um, I wished I had just gone straight to my private loan and started putting that money on that instead of doing it. Like we've only been doing just my private loan for probably the past year. It's made a huge difference. But now I'm yeah. like, I wish I had done that a little bit earlier instead of like continuing to pay the same amounts to both. Like that um, you had prior to the suspension. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. I mean, the only things that they like that my, my loans like take is that we just want to get them paid off so that we don't have to worry about them. <laughs> yeah. Were you, were you disappointed with the, with everything that happened with the student loan forgiveness program? Cause like the bigger one, had you thought that you would, I mean, that would have had a pretty significant impact on your loans, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, my federal loans would be completely gone. Um, had it gone through. And so, um, very much, it was something that I was like, this would be incredible life-changing if this went Mm -hmm. through. Um, Mm -hmm. and that's just me who has a complete handle on my student loans. Like I can't imagine, you know, people who, who, who are making those minimum payments or are even in, um, income-based repayment plans. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it would have been incredible and very sad about it, but I mean, you kind of have to continue chugging along and hope that right. maybe maybe something will come up in the future, even if it's not the amount that they were hoping for. Um, yeah. And does your husband have student loans too? He doesn't. No, he, um, so he only went to school. He has an associate's degree um, and his parents helped support his, his education. He also went to a state school. I went to a private school. Um, and so that's, that's part of that. Um, Mm -hmm. but he, his parents paid while he was in school. And then I think he had maybe two loans and he paid on top of them paying and then it was kind of done. And so even before 
before we were married, his student loans were out of the picture. That makes it a lot easier when there's not two of you having to pay loans. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Very grateful for that. Because we can really attack mine without also having to worry about his. Yeah. And given that you went to a private school and you have a master's, right, for yes. getting that paid for, um, yeah. you really don't have a lot. Before you get yeah. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that. And I'll be honest with you. I chose the institution that I chose for my undergrad is because I received that full tuition scholarship. If I had gone to a state school, I would have still gotten similar financial aid and I still would have gotten a fairly standard scholarship. But I just knew that the experience that I wanted, as well as the opportunity with the scholarship was like it was the right choice if mm-hmm. that makes sense yeah and do you own your home we own the home with the bank um so we do <laughs> that's a great way that is a great way to put it um uh, that's how I view a lot of things like I co-own my my degrees and that we we own our we make a mortgage payment um every <laughs> month so yes and this is our this is our second home so we rented for when we when we got married and lived in at home in New York, we uh, rented an apartment and then we moved to South Carolina. We rented an apartment for about eight months um, and we bought a house. And so we lived in the house for about three and a half, four years um, and then we sold that. So mid pandemic housing prices are higher than kind of what, what they were when we bought. So even though, you know, we had only home owned the home for three to four years, we got an incredible amount of money back on it mm-hmm. that we were then able to use when we moved here to Virginia. Again, we lived in an apartment for a, for eight months um, and then we bought our house here. So we saved everything that we gained on the house. So basically kind of the, once the mortgage was paid off and kind of what was left, we used mm-hmm. that whole chunk for our down payment here. Yeah. And that was what we wanted to do. That was kind of the whole plan um, all along. And we, um, we came into the um, home buying process in Virginia with the mindset of like South Carolina home prices. And it's very different. Um, So we have a house here that is quite a bit larger than our house in South Carolina, but our mortgage payment is also a lot larger just because of the pricing Mm -hmm. um, here that is normally larger than South Carolina. Plus again, that post pandemic heightened um you know listing prices for houses so um and then how did you do with the mortgage rate because you were still buying during the pandemic so we still had low mortgage rates yeah so we i think i'll be honest with you i don't know for sure what our our rate is but i want to say we're at maybe six or seven okay so when did you when did you buy we bought in may of last year so may 2022 a little high i could be very wrong Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's what it is. Um, I know our mortgage payment, but that's, (laughs) and we, we were able, we did a small, we paid down part of it. Yes. Yes. Again, I don't know how that expected, but we just, we looked at what we're going to pay per month, what we had in our down payment and how can we make this the best option for us? So, yeah. Yeah. So are your mortgage payments bigger now than they were in South Carolina? Yeah. yeah so um, they are probably more than doubled what we wow. had in South Carolina. Mm-hmm. But with that, my salary has increased almost mm-hmm. double being up here. Um, so that's something that we also consider. We also knew that our South Carolina home was a short-term investment. Um, it right. was short-term to not be in an apartment and that was really it. Like we just didn't want to be in an apartment. And so that was kind of the house that we were in. We knew we weren't going to be in South Carolina forever. Um, or at least that that wasn't going to be our forever home. And then when we moved up here, we knew that this was more of a, um, forever move. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this house, we, we came into the home buying process as like a, a forever home, so to speak, knowing that I have fairly, good options to increase my salary over time. Mm -hmm. Um, And so knowing that we were able to like pros and cons and things like that. And that's kind of why we went a little bit higher, knowing that we were going to grow into the home, grow into our lives here and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that that's smart. You, you would inspect a little bit, you could afford it. So then that way we won't have to try and upgrade the house, especially yeah. mortgage rates are higher and home prices are higher. Yeah. If you can afford it to stretch it comfortably, you mm -hmm. know, where you're not like house poor. I think that usually works out better. Yeah. Yeah. And we've been really, I want to say lucky, but like we're, we're just, we're very on top of what we're doing with our finances. Like mm -hmm. we have a budget that we use, like we don't like track every single thing, but we're very aware of mm -hmm. like what we want to be spending, where, what we need to be moving into savings. And we save things and we are like paying above the minimum requirement for student loans. So, you know, we're definitely, we, we sacrifice other things so that a, we can have a bigger house, but also so that I can pay up on the savings and pay up on those loans and get those done mm -hmm. with. So the mortgage was based on both salaries, right? Yes. And did you take out life insurance? If something happens to one of you? Yeah. So I have group life insurance through my organization. And okay. then I also have a separate policy for myself um, that gets deducted from my paycheck. Um, in addition to the group that the organization mm -hmm. just pays for by itself and mine also gets deducted. And then my husband also has one through his employer for himself. And, um, the one, so the one you have through work is just, you added life insurance through the supplemental. Yes. Like, through the benefits program. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So have you thought about having uh, it on your own? Because the prop, the only issue with that is it's great, but I always like to say it's like the cherry on top because if God forbid you lose your job, you lose your life insurance. Often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's definitely worth considering. This is our, so I only just added the life insurance, probably the additional life insurance, probably a mm -hmm. couple of months ago from conversations of like, Hey, we should probably do this. And they were offering, um, they were offering it at the time through, through the employer. So, I mean, certainly as we look ahead, that's something that we do need to consider is, you know, not employer based, but separate. Yeah. Or just make sure that if it's employer based that you can keep the policy, I mean, lose the job or you get let go from the job or what have you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Some will let you convert mm -hmm. after, like but that. you're so, you're so young right now that signing up for a term policy is cheaper than when you do it later. Like yeah. Every, every year I feel like it, it goes up. Yeah. Cause you're, you could probably get like, gosh, I'm just trying to think. I think I got two million, two million of term at twenty nine. And I think it's a hundred bucks. It's like two cheap. Yeah. And then and then that way, like as Lindsay's saying, like if you go to convert it, it could be more expensive. If you go to convert it, it depends on the employer, like what they're offering. But if you go to convert it for like health questions or yeah. so you, if you if you get your own, you can just oh, take it with you from the job to job and you don't have to worry about it and then you have it locked in. Yeah, I like that a lot. And that's something like even um, that I never thought of. So I've always taken on, obviously, the um, the one provided through the employer, the one that you don't have to pay for or anything like that. And then my husband and I were talking about it with the house being a lot more of an expense mm -hmm. than our previous house. Um, you know, we are getting older. I mean, yes, we're only 30, but still. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but then even um, like talking to my parents, they are on the cusp of retirement and my dad is my co-signer on my student loans and their like retirement advisor, I guess, was like, Hey, we would recommend potentially you taking out a life insurance policy on her, even just for mm -hmm. a short term until those loans are paid off. And I was like, Oh my, you know, I just, I never would have thought that a, that would need to be covered, but it's like, yes, mm -hmm. when you die, who pays, like, who pays your... Well, the the reason is not, it, you, that doesn't continue unless you have a co-signer. So your dad being a co-signer is actually the primary, but that's who they lend the money to. They actually wouldn't lend it to you. Right. So if you had had enough credit, which you don't when you're going to school, they would have given the loan in your name, but because you didn't have enough credit because of your age and lack of credit history and income and all that, they lend the money to your father. Both names are on, but you can apply to have the cosigner removed if you've been making consistent. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, they don't advertise that, but yeah. <laughs> okay, I will look into that. Thank you. Yeah, I take the paperwork. It's a bit of a paperwork process, yeah. but you could do one of. I mean, I think it's still worth investigating having your own term life insurance policy just because you just because the mortgage is high. It sounds like if one of you passes away prematurely, the other person's kind of stuck. 
Mm-hmm. So at least want to cover cover that for your, your spouse. Um, and then you could, if you do do that, if you don't do the cosigner removal, you could add your dad as a partial beneficiary on that to cover the loan balance. But I would just do the cosigner. I would just do the removal. There's a there's a form, and it it sounds like you just have to be making payments and use an application and then you submit it and they could remove the cosigner because now you're good credit worthiness and so they should yeah. be able to just take him off okay perfect thank you great but we've seen i've seen the reverse where the parent died so that's statistically more likely and then the loan becomes immediately due in full mm. for the child who's not always a child yes you have to read the terms of the loan but oh with private, yeah it can come it came due immediately and so I had a woman come into my office and she was like, they're saying I have to pay the whole loan and I just, I can't pay the whole loan. I just need to make payments because it was a bit, was a bit more than what you have, like by a multiple. And um, her dad passed away suddenly and the loan became due immediately. Hmm. I've never thought of that. And I guess that's part of the lack of literacy that exists around student loans, but also that, you know... <laughs> I went to, so I went to school in 2010 was when I went to undergrad and I feel like it was still very much a culture of like, get the loans and move on. And, you know, like this is what they give you. And so you kind of just, I don't want to say you accept it, but you do, you go on and maybe you search for a, a private provider who is likely mailing you anyway, cause you're of the age that you would be mm-hmm. going to college. And, um, you know, those things you don't think about, like, and that would never even like, if my dad died tomorrow, like, you know what I mean? I wouldn't even think of that. Yeah. And I think a lot of it's financial literacy, but the other part is I find the student loan a little bit predatory. When you go to sign for a mortgage, they explain how it works. You have it all outlined for you. This is your principal payment. This is your interest payment. This is how many yeah. years to pay it. And then it's done. There's like no really complicated conditions. And there's no big, you never heard anyone be like, oh my God, I had no idea what my mortgage payment was. I've been paying it for years and it's gone up. That doesn't happen with mortgage. Right. Regulation. With student loans, you've been making your payment every month, following, doing exactly what they told you, and all of a sudden your balance goes up, which was, in my opinion, very predatory. And they mm-hmm. don't disclose how they're handling the loan, especially for private. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think that there's like that initial conversation about like what it could look like or, or what it could be, but you also don't know what your life is going to look like when right. you graduate or, no. you know, like my, my loans were not deferred, but like they continued to build interest for those two additional years that I was in, that I was in grad school. Grad school. Yeah. So definitely, I think on both sides, Barbara, both the predatory and the, a lack Literacy. of like just asking the questions and looking into yeah. it. I think it is getting better. There's try there's more clarity and I think if you do some research you can even see like if you graduate from college, like how much are grads earning? Because I mean, that's a big question too. Like you can get this really fancy degree that costs you a thousand, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh-huh. Yeah, hundreds all of thousands. Said and done, right? <laughs> and um end up with a job that doesn't, you know, mm-hmm. with a salary that doesn't keep up with with what the cost was. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, uh, having worked in education and working with students, I worked for a short time as an academic advisor. A lot of these students coming in have no concept of what they want to do, or they kind of have an idea. And even then it's, you know, what is that earning potential? Sometimes Mm -hmm. they know, sometimes they don't know. Sometimes Mm -hmm. they, they make a complete 180, they fail a course and they realize that that that's not what's right. And then even then what they come in they sign for March, April, May, when they, you know, sign that deposit to go to school. And then what happens in September, October, just a couple of months later can completely change everything. So it sounds like you and your husband are really good at communicating about money. Yeah, I think it's something that we've worked at over the years that we've been both together and married. Um, it's yeah. definitely been a process. And I, I wouldn't say that we're perfect at it. I think sure. um, with circumstances in the last couple of years, we've had to have that. So every time that I've moved for a job, because when we move, it's my job that takes us, he's then in the process of looking for a job. So that's a couple months of him not having a job while he's looking for them. And that's, you know, that's our choice. That's what we choose to do. But with that 
comes those conversations about like, okay, we're on one salary right now. We don't really want to touch our savings. So this is kind of what we need to be focused on. And I'm very grateful that we are in the same sort of thought process on where we are both with my debt, as well as where we are with our house and our approach to buying vehicles and sort of all of that. Because if we if we weren't, it would be that much more difficult. And there's some things we disagree on as natural um, being raised in different households with different kind of view sets on money. Mm -hmm. Um, But we're definitely kind of transitioning into this whole, it's our money. Yes, they are my student loans, but our money pays Mm -hmm. them because then we can do more Mm -hmm. with our money later on. And how are you and your husband raised? Because we're finding that it seems like a lot of how you were raised and what you learned growing up impacts how you handle your finances. Yeah. So I would say that we were both raised in fairly like fiscally conservative viewpoints, Mm -hmm. um, but how that kind of existed is different. So my parents shared bank accounts, um, shared everything. His parents still have like separate cards, separate bank accounts are very much like, oh, I'll cover this. Oh, I'll cover that. Whereas like my parents, it's one big pot. Um, And so that was my viewpoint growing up. And so for me, it was like never a conversation of if we like shouldn't pool our resources or, you know, anything like that, you know, your, your spouses, your partners in life. So you're, you're going towards the same goals, essentially financially. They are also the same way. Um, They don't live ostentatiously his my husband's parents don't live ostentatiously um you know both of my parents grew like we grew up in modular like modular double wides Mm -hmm. um our parents like two vehicles like very standard like not you know one vacation a year one vacation a year how it looked was a little bit differently but bringing those together we've leaned a little bit more to kind of my parents viewpoint and I don't know if that's Mm -hmm. just because of me and like my, I don't want to say being the breadwinner, but kind of where we sit financially wise together as a couple, like me bringing their strong viewpoints into that. But, you know, Lindsay, in your book, you had that list of like questions that couples should consider. And honestly, we really never talked about money or like what we would do. It just sort of luckily happened naturally, which I think is probably not I don't want to say not normal, but, um, so we went through those questions together now, you know, as 30 year olds who've been together. And it was kind of funny that we both had very much the same viewpoints, which I'm like, okay, great. I'm glad we're still on track (laughs) with everything. Um, but when we, we got married in July and we, because we were engaged, we weren't like, I was still very much like, I'll pay the rent. You'll pay for the groceries. You'll mm-hmm. pay for the electric sure. and the cable, that sort of thing. And then we got married and we moved to South Carolina two months later. And so we only opened one bank account when we moved a, a savings and a checking. And so by yeah. happenstance, we just automatically joined our finances together. Yeah. And I think that there wasn't much thought in that other than at the time it was what we needed yeah. to do. And you know, I think that's still what we would have done anyways, but I'm kind of glad that that brought us to it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I very, I think it was similar. Like it just happened. Like we didn't really talk about it. We just did it, but we had actually bought, we bought our apartment before we got married by like a couple of months. So I don't really know why we didn't do it before that. Like while we were going through that whole process, I don't know, but we had the problem that all the checks were addressed to him and to me with his last name, even though I didn't take his last name. So I was like, fine, this is the only way to like navigate this is just have a shared bank account. And I yeah. thought kind of that maybe we keep separate and then we never did it's kind of, you know, it's one big pool. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, I mean, like reflecting on it, even like my sister, um, and her soon to be, um, ex-husband, unfortunately, Um, But when they were together, I mean, it was still like they had a joint account, but they both still had separate accounts and kind of did Mm -hmm. a similar sort of like, okay, well, this will come out of here and this will come out of here and, and that sort of thing. So, I mean, I think it also, I mean, for us, it's just depended on like our viewpoints and it's all been sort of happenstance that we haven't really had those conversations or necessarily needed to, because it's all kind of fallen into the way that I would have liked, luckily. (laughs) (laughs) 
And you mentioned you are the breadwinner, like you, you earn the higher income. Like how's that, you know, how has that been? Like, I feel like it's changing in some ways where it's not as unusual, but there still are some like old stereotypes around it. Yeah. I mean, I think luckily for us, um, my husband and I started dating right before we graduated high school. Um, and so he's been along for every like career option in my mind that I've had and mm-hmm. every like, like it was sort like I graduated valedictorian from high school. So it was kind of very much a, an expectation that I was going to go on and do, I don't want to say big things, but like, you know, I was going to go on and, and try to make a decent living and, and create a life for us. And, um, you know, I think when we maybe first, like when we first got married, he was the breadwinner um, because education in South Carolina isn't um, supported the way that it is elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we moved up here and that shifted. And so we were kind of like, when we were in South Carolina, we both made about the same. And then now since I've advanced in my career, um, he's sort of plateaued and I've can continue to grow his dream is to be retired like he wants to putter around the garage he wants to work on projects like that's his dream and my dream is to be able to provide that for him if if that comes into our future um so I think at first it was a little bit like oh but then I kind of laid it out and like you know the the two positions that are ahead of me this is where they are earning wise and he was like well if you get that then that means and I'm like that's exactly what it means so you know let's let's think about like what that means for me to kind of continue to grow in my career and you can still be here doing what you need to do until we get to a point where my salary also replaces yours so what does your husband do now just curious yeah. So he works in retail. Um, he works for, um, a company with their district. So like he works in the stores, but he works, he reports to a district manager and okay. they do, um, like merchandising and, mm-hmm. um, they set up displays. And so like right now, for example, they're switching everything over for fall from summer. So that's what he does. And yeah. so do you think, so you think, if your salary gets to where he doesn't have to work, you he would be fine. He would be comfortable with him saying, okay, I'm not going to work anymore. And absolutely. It. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially as we like look ahead to like the future of having children. Um, mm-hmm. That is something that as a 30-year-old woman weighs on my mind. Um, mm-hmm. But also the decisions around childcare, the cost of childcare, the availability of childcare. Like I work with... Um, three women who who have toddlers like infants and toddlers and the amount that they have to come in and out because a a room is closed or because they have staff professional development I'm like that's a lot to manage um you know and and we're lucky that we have some level of freedom to work remotely but or to um you know take PTO as as needed but not everyone has that and so you know thinking about our situation and like can I get to a point where even potentially it's just my salary and he can stay home with the kids and still tinker in the garage while they're sleeping and like that kind of stuff um I think that would be a goal in the future if it's an option um but you know we'll see a lot can happen in the meantime okay so I have a good friend I have a good friend who who her husband stays home they have three kids and she has she works for a big bank and she likes to joke that her husband's a very good stay-at-home dad and a terrible stay-at-home mom. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Okay. So I I guess I was thinking you were going to retire him and he could just be retired at at like 35. So you're thinking more like for, if you have kids, then he would be the stay-at-home. Yeah. 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 And we uh, like, that's definitely been part of the conversation because I'm at like, I would love to like be able to homeschool my kids and be at home with them and everything like that. But between the two of us, the one who has the earning potential is me. The one who's also paid more for their career is me. So, you know, we are shifting into kind of that realization of like, 
you know, I can't change jobs willy nilly anymore. I can't, um, you know, even change areas within higher education anymore because I'm kind of on this path of, you know, if we want to be financially secure in the future, I kind of have to continue along it and we have to be really thoughtful about that. Um, and so those conversations have switched. Whereas like a couple years ago when we were like, yeah, you know, maybe I would stay home and homeschool the kids and stuff like that. But now that's not an option for me or, you know, our family, for me to be the one that would stay with the kids until they're older or something like that. So, but again, all of that can change. Life changes, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's good, it's good to have a plan and it's good to have the conversation. Yeah. 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 And, we're big planners in general. He and I are both very similar in that we think about all the things to come in the future. Um, and whether that's healthy or not, we always like to have backup plans and like backup plans within backup plans. Um, and that is, you know, kind of how, like, obviously I would love for them to go to a great, you know, preschool or daycare, have an incredible opportunity there, socialize, but also that might not be the reality. So we also want to think about kind of our, our other options there. That's great. It's nice when you find somebody that you can be a planner with. Yeah. Yeah. It's been great. And we were both dreamers in that fact of like, we both think like we have goals that we would like to accomplish together as a couple in terms of not just our finances, but also opportunities that we want to have. If children aren't in our future, like we would like to be able to support my niece and nephew. We would like to be able to have opportunities for our family that either we didn't have or that we just would have enjoyed or would have liked. And we want to be able to um, get to a point where we can do that as well. Yeah, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah, when you plan your finances, it gives you a lot of control. Yeah, yeah. And I think about that just in terms of like not to go back to student loans, but you know, if, if I didn't see exactly how many payments it would take to get them paid off, like we did that um, about a month or two ago just to kind of see how far on track we are based on what we have in savings, based on what we're paying monthly, my private loans can be gone in December. And that's our goal because I can see that painted painted out, you know what I mean? That I don't have to just go by what, like what the the thing online says, but we can really kind of see like, okay, well, if we, we attack this one and then we just make a lump sum payment and then we put that same amount towards this, then we can be here. And so our goal um, based on that is to be completely paid off by next December. So December, 2024 with mm -hmm. just standard monthly payments and then paying kind of a lump sum at the end. So, but if we didn't have the time, attention or care to look into that, then we'd still just be paying willy nilly mm -hmm. and, um, people yeah. do that. And that, if that's kind of how they prefer to deal with that, then, you know, that's them, but we want to get rid of it. And so that's kind of how we, how we look at it. And that's us like sitting together and like, you know, he, when I pay my student loans, he comes and looks and we're just constantly kind of thinking about that. Yeah, that's impressive. And it makes it, it makes a big difference to like have a plan rather than just to make the payments. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's exciting. You'll be done with it so soon. Yes. Very excited. <laughs> ready, yeah. ready to be done with it. Ready to <laughs> put that money towards something else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this was so interesting to have you on. I appreciate you sharing the story with us. Yeah, thank you guys. And thank you for the info about the the life insurance and then also the co-signer for my loan. So it's very helpful. And I'm going to go work on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably going to ask them what the application process is. And then I would just look at your own term policy for each you and your husband while you're really young. And yeah. Just buy a cheap term policy. Very good. So thank you yeah. so much for coming on and sharing everything with us.